All right, we are in Windows World again. Now there is an old familiar face. You were on Channel 9 many years ago. Who are you? Refresh people's memory. Okay, well I'm Dave Probert. I'm a kernel architect uh, working in the core of Windows. And I've been working here at Microsoft on kernel related stuff for going on 13 years now. Excellent. I remember that interview that we did, I think it was three or four years ago now. Uh, very popular, one of the early Going Deep interviews. Um, which is a series on Channel 9, which mm -hmm. this will be a part of as well. Uh, people really loved how, how we taught them a lot about the kernel and the comparisons to different kernels and the evolution of the Windows kernel. It's yeah. all really good stuff. Yeah. We love kernel stuff on Going Deep, obviously. Yeah. So what have you been working on since then? What's, what's going on? Well, I've been really doing two, two different kinds of things. Uh, the most important, interesting thing to me is I've been working on stuff that's going into Windows 7. And in fact, I finished that a while back. I'm actually working on Windows 8 and Windows 9, which uh -huh. I really can't tell you a lot because we haven't decided what we're going to do and not do. But I can start to tell you more about the Windows 7 work now. So I've been doing that. I've also been doing a lot of work with universities. Uh -huh. So I've had to get extra pages in my passport because I've been traveling all around the world talking to faculty and students in universities and giving out source code to the Windows kernel. Uh huh. And this, this has been really very cool. Uh, uh -huh. I think when I got here, uh, coming from mostly a Unix background and also a very strong university background in addition to uh, the other kinds of things I did. I spent a lot of time in graduate school to get my PhD. Mm. And so when I came here I realized that there's kind of a culture war that goes on between like the Unix community and companies like Microsoft. And I realized that I'd been through that culture war before when it was between Unix and VMS and it was came from digital with the VAX. Mm. And so one of the things that I did, and I found out there's a lot of support for this at Microsoft, is, is try and do a better job of giving materials and information to universities so they can teach about Windows. Because I think the Windows kernel is really cool, really exciting. I'm really glad that the people who watch Channel 9 mm -hmm. are so enthused about uh, the kinds of things they can learn about the kernel. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think it's really cool. There are a lot of interesting and, and really uh, provocative ideas, ideas that really get you to, to think. And so that's what I've been doing with the universities and, and giving out the source code. And, People are putting it in courses and doing projects. And mm. I remember one Korean university how the students uh, came back after a few months after the quarter and started giving the professor even more feedback. They said it was kind of cool when we were doing it, mm. but when we started doing our, our interviews with future employers and they said, "What'd you do in your operating system class?" They said, "I was hacking on the Windows kernel." That really caught attention. So it's been fun. It's been fun seeing a great response. And so that's mm. my university um, stuff. Went to India this year, been to Excellent. Europe, gone to North Africa, I'm going to go to China mm. yet again in, in a couple months. Uh, it just took a long time to list all the countries, South America, places in North America. It's been a lot of fun because I see the same kinds of interest and enthusiasm mm -hmm. about the Windows kernel that you're also seeing from your viewers. Sure. But the most fun stuff I'm doing lately has been looking at what we can do about the coming mini core challenge. We talk a lot about that on Channel 9. What are, so, I mean, I had an interview with, of course, Mark Krasinovich. Mm -hmm. You work with him, you know him. Um, he's standing right there outside my office. standing right outside the office. I doubt he wants to be on Channel 9 yet again. Um, but one of the things that was made clear in the interview, and I think Channel 9 was sort of the first place to reveal this information, uh, was that Windows 7 can sort of scale to 256 processors mm -hmm. because of the work that Arun Kishan yeah. has done primarily around the spin lock dispatcher yes. reworking, replumbing. Yes, that, that was locks. great. That was great work that Arun did. Mm -hmm. But it primarily affects uh, those number of processors, those number of cores mm -hmm. or physical threads, which you really find more on server platforms. The real challenge we have going forward isn't as much servers because mm -hmm. we're doing great work on that. But server applications tend to be fairly highly parallel to begin with because they've been able to afford lots and lots and lots of cores. The challenge with the client is we're going to get lots and lots and lots of cores, mm. ultimately, whether we like them or not. And so we're at a, a huge turning point uh, in the evolution of computers, and particularly consumer-oriented computers like the, the PC. Sure. And uh, sometimes people say Moore's Law is taking, continues to be true, but it's taking a sharp left turn or a sharp right turn, depends how you look at the graph. But the way I look at it is we're now in an era when Moore's Law encounters Amdahl's Law. Hmm. And that's the essential challenge that we have with Minicore, particularly for consumer platforms. 
scientific work, the HPC work that we do, we've, we've been working on that for a long time. People in universities, industry have been at, working on that for a very long time, Certainly. decades and decades. It's also true of servers. But when it comes to the client, we face a lot of really new, interesting challenges. So Moore's Law basically is the number of transistors would double on something like 18 months. And if you look at Intel's curves, I just go to the website and look, it's, it's really maybe 22 months, but doubling of transistors. And a lot of those transistors have gone into increasing clock rate and making things faster. But if you start to get into it, you realize that there are some real difficulties dissipating the power. And so I won't go into those details because I'm sure you'll have other people talk about that. But the result is we're going to get more cores out of those transistors and maybe more and simpler cores as we face the challenge together about power. Mm -hmm. And so on client machines, you start to get all these different kinds of, of cores because they won't all just be the same. How do you use them to more effectively speed up the computation and more importantly improve the experience people have with computing? Mm -hmm. So that's Moore's Law and that's the effect of Moore's Law. Amdahl's Law goes way back into uh, you know three or four decades now where Amdahl observed that it's really a matter of diminishing returns. It's the weakest link in performance that determines your overall bandwidth. Mm -hmm. If your program is half computation you can't parallelize and half computation that you can parallelize really, really well. Well, if you parallelize the parallel, parallel part across an infinite number of processors, you can run it essentially in zero time. And your application will now run only twice as fast despite having infinite processors. That's the effect of Amdahl's law. Mm. And so now the challenge is Moore's law continues, but it produces more parallelism in the computer. Amdahl's law says that you better really watch out for the serial part of your computation because that will become your performance challenge. And so that's the challenge we face now. So in Windows 7, we started to take some initial steps in, in what we're shipping, uh, not so much directly to help uh, end programmers directly, mm -hmm. but really in support of our parallel computing platform team, who we yes. used to think they were on drugs, but then we realized PCP stood for something else. Yes. And so, <laughs> anyway, they're, they're great guys to work with, and they're, they're really doing the pioneering work at Microsoft which will build the platform. So in their developer 10 release, which uh, is working its way mm -hmm. uh, out, they will expose a whole lot of new parallel technologies which will become building blocks for people writing applications. Excellent, yeah. One of the primary things they're doing is something called the concurrency runtime. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me spell this, because otherwise nobody will know how to spell it. Concurrency runtime, Yes. which as you can guess, we pronounce concert. Concert, absolutely. This is concert. Yeah. And concert is based on some ideas that if you have uh, multiple CPUs, you're basically going to establish queues, and concert's going to feed work into these queues and then provide an interface of code that runs between the CPUs and these queues of work. And these queues of work feed into each of the CPUs using a scheduler, which is part of concert. Mm -hmm. And this scheduler will still work from other queues if it runs out. So if there's a CPU over here and there's nothing left in this queue, it will go still work from some other queue in order to do load balancing. And so this is really cool, but this impacts my world in the kernel quite a bit. Let's talk about that. Okay. So let's back up a little bit from what they're trying to do here and talk about some very basic things about how you control the CPU, about threading, about fibers, and then we'll talk about something that's new in Windows 7 called user mode scheduling. Yes. And even though we call it user mode scheduling, user mode scheduling is not a completely new idea, but I'll talk about what it is that we're doing and some of our requirements and constraints. So let's get rid of this picture and now just sort of talk about the basic model of what a thread really is. Now, hmm. when most people think about threads, they really think about a programming construct that gives them parallelism. Because a thread really is, is two kinds of things. It's a programming concept that you use to think in terms of your program. You think of the, the parallelism yep. and the concurrency in my program. Uh -huh. And that's very cool. Um, but it's also used to get you access to physical resources like CPUs. Mm -hmm. 
And so how do we transform this programming construct, this thread, into a CPU? This is actually kind of an interesting challenge. Well, the way that we do it in Windows, the primary way, is that if you have, so I'll put my physical CPUs back up here, if you have a physical CPU and you have this uh, logical concept of threads, so I won't write T in all of them, but you know what these are, mm -hmm. you can set an affinity. You can say that this thread will only run on these two CPUs. It turns out the most interesting thing that people usually do is they'll assign threads to particular CPUs. And now the thread represents the CPU. As long as nothing else is running in the system, which usually is, especially in clients, this thread basically will effectively be the CPU. And so if I was doing that scheduler in concert I showed you before, mm -hmm. it wants to allocate an NT thread and it wants to bind it using affinity, it's a Win32 call to set the affinity, to run on a particular core. And now these threads represent CPUs. But there's this programming model aspect of threads also. Well, what does the programming model really mean? Well, let's move over here just a little. So we'll leave this up this time. So in the programming model, you basically have three concepts you put together. You have the idea of a stack. This represents where you've been in your program. You have the idea of the current register state, the current execution. This is things like, well, what is your stack pointer? What is your uh, instruction pointer, or your program counter, as we used to call them? What are the registers that the compiler is using to keep your variables and doing the computation on them? And this is the state that's really associated generally with a thread. The third thing you add in here is you have this notion of CPU. You say that I start executing on a CPU by taking the real program counter mm -hmm. and setting that in the CPU, so this is part of the CPU, to point at the instruction in the thread that I want to execute. So that's pretty simply what a thread is, and then it gets more complicated <laughs> from there. So. One thing I'll say about that now that I've erased it mm -hmm. is the reason threads get interesting as a programming model is that you can block in a thread. You can come to a point of execution where you say, I need something else to happen before I can continue. Mm -hmm. And so you can suspend the thread and wait for something to happen, for somebody to release a lock, for an I.O. to complete, for a system service to finish. You can wait for that to happen and then you can resume. And there are this is called synchronization, and there are a number of synchronization primitives that allow you to, to, to block like that. Mm. So this is where threads start to become different from a CPU. Because a CPU never really blocks. It sort of does. At the very bottom, it has a pause instruction. The halt instruction will wait for an interrupt. Mm. But CPUs don't really block. Threads block. And so if threads block, then you find yourself mapping all these threads I showed onto these CPUs yeah. in a blocking world, now you say, well, I've got to have multiple threads that are mapping onto these CPUs somehow, because if one thread blocks, then how do I continue getting work to happen? Yep. Okay. So I'll tell you one more thing about concert, and then we'll start talking about some of the stuff we're doing in terms of changing the thread model a little bit for NT. Cool. Concert doesn't think in terms of its programming model in terms of threads. So let's draw another layer up here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to assume single thread per CPU. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about why that's kind of important. But these T's up here are threads, but there's also work or they're tasks yeah. which represent things that you want to do. And these are those cues that I showed you in the previous picture. So I guess singular queue. And this is the work items 
that are being mapped onto CPUs, which are represented by threads and concert. So instead of having the model I described, where you have work and uh, you think of it as a thread, and the thread is something that exists for a long time in your program, you have very small pieces of work, relatively, which you can spread out. Well, why is this important to have smaller pieces of work? It's because of Amdahl's law. Hmm. The reason it becomes important to have smaller pieces of work is that if we try and find big pieces of work where we have coarse grain parallelism, it's very hard to find that kind of work on client-like scenarios. So you want to find very small pieces of work because you expect to find a lot more of them hmm. and be able to spread them out. So you can find, at the design level, large coarse parallelism in programs if they're written the right way, but you can also find very fine-grained parallelism, and you find a lot more of that in ordinary programs. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been doing that in the hardware for a very long time. That's why we pipeline the execution of multiple instructions, and the hardware figures out, I can do these three instructions, and these two instructions, and this one has to wait for a memory operation to complete. So hardware has been doing this kind of superscalar, it's called scheduling, mm -hmm. for a very long time. But now in the runtime, we want to be able to do that kind of, a uh, little bit higher than the hardware, of course, but very fine-grained scheduling where you take your program and you break it up. Hey, Mark Rosinovich. Uh Mark just <laughs> stuck his head in my window. Nice. Uh, he's, he's very familiar with what I'm doing. Absolutely. And so they break work into these tasks, and mm -hmm. then they map these tasks onto the threads which represent CPUs. And that's where UMS comes into it. So now I'm going to erase all this Absolutely. and talk about... And just so you know, I mean, people on Channel 9 have seen a lot from the PCP team. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, we cover the concert runtime. Yes. Or concert concurrency runtime. Uh, we'll probably go over and talk more. So they understand the notion of task-based parallelism, mm -hmm. replacing Good. the need to ever think about threads explicitly. Yes. Threads just, they happen to you know, move up a le level of abstraction, think in terms of tasks, magic happens for you. Yes. So they're sort of, they're, they're, they're got that in their heads already. That's good. This so is I good. Hope, I hope I won't confuse them. Okay. The reason I might be in danger of confusing them uh -oh. is being a kernel guy. <laughs> it's like I'm the guy who's on the dolly underneath the car looking yeah. up at the engine. Yeah. And most of your listeners and the concert guys are the guys with the hood open looking down at the engine. Certainly. So sometimes it looks a little bit different to me. But I'm just really trying to give you the essential <laughs> points so I can tie it together with some of the work that we're but doing. But you know, that's exactly why we do what we're doing, right? We, we, we go and we look at the top down from what they're doing up mm -hmm. in user mode world and up in the sort of the programming layer abstraction world. Uh, most developers aren't kernel developers and don't spend much time down there, thankfully. Um, but yeah, you're the guy behind the guy behind the guy. We love the kernel team. We were just here yesterday talking to the service controller uh -huh. uh, developer. Fish Very interesting stuff. Absolutely. Great guy. Amazing, very nice guy, and great work that they've done. So, yes. you know, don't be afraid to confuse a little bit. But okay. people are watching this, knowing that we're talking about kernel now, Windows okay. kernel. So it's kind of like looking up, to see Absolutely. what's going on. So let's Absolutely. do it. Okay, so let me try not to blow anybody's mind, but I'm now going to blow tear, mind is good. I'm going to tear threads into pieces. Do it. Destroy them. So what people think of as a thread, in terms of the system, an NT thread, is really two threads. Okay. So let's go talk about that. So, and I realize there's a certain bias I always have, and people point this out to me, mm. that somehow when I draw the kernel, it's not to scale. It always seems much larger <laughs> than people in user mode might draw the kernel. So okay. forgive me that. But we'll put kernel, and we'll put user mode. Okay. Now that thread I showed you before with uh, the stack and the CPU. And you also, excuse me, you put the kernel on top. I like that. Yes. <laughs> so we're looking at it, we turn, to turn it upside down. Now, now this actually, there's a historic reason for this. <laughs> Let's okay. talk about that. Well, it's simply that uh, people started writing their user mode programs at zero mm. before there was any kernel. And so we got addresses that tend to start with this hex value or other variants, but it's high order addresses. Got it. So if your address space grows up, <laughs> unlike your stacks, which for historical reasons grow down, yeah. your address space grows up, we get to be on top. Good. Okay? All right, well, so I don't feel guilty about that. It's a not, not to scale all. thing I feel guilty about. Right on. Okay. There's a lot more code outside the kernel than there is in the kernel. I would imagine. So you, ha you have your stack, and there's something else here that's very important we'll get to in a minute. Um, you have this concept of a CPU, which is really um, the kernel giving you control and letting you run. And you have your registers, which simply mean that when the kernel gives you control and lets you run, it loads your registers from that that save state. So that's fine. But 
this thread here, this user mode thread, so we'll call this a user thread, is actually a corresponding kernel thread. It has a kernel stack. It has kernel registers. It has its own data structures that represent it. So when you go from user mode, cross into the kernel, we actually switch threads on you. You switch from running this UT, this user thread, to running the KT, the corresponding kernel thread. And these things are corresponding because we actually know that this user thread corresponds to this kernel thread. Now you can build systems where that's not true. For a long time people were building something called scheduler activations from uh, um, Anderson and Brashad here at University of Washington mm -hmm. and I think Solaris implemented some of this although I think they've now ripped it out and that was the idea that I might actually have multiple things like kernel threads they were called activations that might be used on demand for a particular user thread. But in NT there's a reason we're sticking to a one-to-one -one mapping in what we did in Windows 7 Okay. And that's because of compatibility. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be very sure that if we made changes in the relationship between user threads and kernel threads, that all that code, all that huge amount of code in user mode, would continue to run just like it did before. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about user scheduling and fibers and something that we didn't really have worked out until Windows 7. And I'll tell you a little bit about the, the history of kind of how we got there because it's a little bit interesting. Great. Um, there's another thing in user mode in Windows which is kind of important is the thread environment block or the tab. And this exists in the user mode address space and among many other fields and, and things it contains it has something called a thread local store. Because if you think about a multi-threaded program you have globals, things that are accessible to all the threads. You have data that's on your stack and that works as long as your scoping is correct so that when you call down into routines they make allocations and then re return they can't use the allocations anymore. You can allocate stuff out of the heap but how do you have stuff that only your thread knows about its instance of it? How do you have an instance of storage that belongs to your thread? So different parts of your program, different parts of your libraries, different invocations of the same library on the same thread can share variables mm -hmm. but not share them with anybody else in the program. Well that's what thread local store is. And this is heavily used as are many of the fields in the tab. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Let me tell you about fibers. So fibers is something that we shipped uh, in NT long ago and probably from the beginning we, we recommended people not use this in general hmm. because it provided them with a way of doing user mode switching and yet it doesn't give you full compatibility with Win32. There are potential problems, landmines lying there so if you use fibers and you call into arbitrary APIs which people do in Windows because of the richness of the programming environment sure. you may find something going wrong because you are relying on sharing something on that thread and thread local store Fibers don't work with Thread Local Store. Hmm. They have something called Fiber Local Store, and it's not the same as Thread Local Store. Fibers are completely a user mode idea. They're mapped onto a single NT thread just by multiplexing the fiber onto it, and there's some real compatibility difficulties with fibers. And so that's what we've had in the past. Now SQL uh, uses fibers, right? Or they SQL did. gets their best performance out of fibers, but they're cautious about recommending that their customers arbitrarily adopt fibers for the better performance. There's a lot of testing and a lot of thinking through sure. they would have to do to be sure that the fibers would work. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about SQL in a minute, because UMS, User Mode Scheduling in Windows 7, we actually did some work with SQL, which is actually kind of, of interesting. Excellent. So fibers had this problem that they didn't switch the thread environment block, they relied on their own special fiber state. And we have within Microsoft, uh, we have a number of different groups that do incubations and one of them works for our chief strategy and research officer Craig Mundy mm -hmm. and there's a team they're doing things like uh, they have a group doing incubations with quantum computing at one of the more stellar research uh, environments. Uh, place actually across from where my office was when I was at UC Santa Barbara was the Institute for Theoretical Physics. Yeah. And these guys are doing just amazing work now. 
with uh, quantum computing. So they do things like that. Well, we're not quite at the quantum computing scale here, but they have a systems group under Paul England who's just doing really amazing and interesting work in terms of trying to find solutions to problems that we just haven't invested in enough because we had other things to do and we didn't really say, oh, let's go solve that problem. And so they step back, being an incubation team, and say, you know, if we could solve this problem. So they work very closely with uh, the PCP team, mm -hmm. and they aren't on drugs either. They actually are really smart guys. And Paul said, you know, the tab is a little bit hard to switch in user mode between different instances of the threat environment block. In NT, normally we switch in the kernel before we come back to user mode mm -hmm. in a threat. And he thought about that and looked at the uh, x86 instruction set and the x64 and the itanium. And he says, you know, I think there's a way we can do this. And so he came up with a mechanism for doing it involving the segment registers. It's not just in direction. The tab is actually accessed through the segmentation of the x86, and that's what makes it complicated. It's not just change a pointer. It's actually change the segmentation registers. So he worked out the details. He solved that problem. He now said, you know, we can take fibers and we can turn them into what he was calling filaments. Now, this became, after he gave it over to me to do the architecture on for Windows, this became, I said, well, I'm going to rename this to user mode scheduling. And the reason I renamed it is because we're going to maintain, at least for the next release or so, this relationship between user threads and kernel threads. And so it's not like fibers where you're multiplexing many different fibers onto the same NT thread. Hmm. We actually have this one-to-one -one relationship. And so what we're really allowing is user mode scheduling. So let me now tell you what UMS does, and then we'll talk about how Concert takes advantage of it. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to need user mode and kernel mode. I'm going to need this concept of UT, which I'll redraw in a moment. I don't need to talk about fibers or filaments anymore. We're going to talk about UMS, user mode scheduling. And so down here, I have something we call uh, a use schedule or a user scheduler. And the user scheduler has user threads that it knows about and the corresponding kernel threads up here. So I probably should like number them or something. And here's what the mechanism is for how we did user mode threading. It's actually very simple. Using uh, Paul and, and the guy who did the, the prototype implementation, Matt, using their trick about modifying the segment registers to switch the tab, you can write code that actually, without going into the kernel, switches between these different user mode threads and switches back. Now, if you go into the kernel, mm -hmm. there's a slight problem now because we thought that you were running user thread zero. And if you enter the kernel's user thread 2, because the user scheduler switched to user thread 2, we have to fix that. So that's what we do, is that when you enter the kernel, we say, gee, we thought we were this, you're really this. Let's switch and run that. So this is, this is one of perhaps the two key aspects of computer science, the things that we leverage more than ever. The two things we leverage in computer science, abstraction, well, that sometimes creates trouble, but that's why threads and CPUs are related, is threads are an abstraction of <laughs> CPUs. Let me go off a tangent just for a moment, tell you a little bit about the history of threads and why it's different in NT versus Other Linux. Other Okay. Yeah. When we, in the, in the uh, 60s, started to get multiprocessors, the only people who bought and could afford computers in the 60s were large corporations running very large data centers that had really powerful, huge room-sized computers with an incredible amounts of uh, memory and, and CPU that were probably less complicated than what's on my cell phone. Yeah. But it was really <laughs> important back then, and, and they had a lot of I.O. capability. Sure. And so they wanted to get more throughput for their jobs by adding more processors. Then in the 70s, computers downsized a certain amount, and many computers came along. First is laboratory equipment, digital equipment, Data General had the Nova series. Uh, there were a number of different companies who, who came up with smaller, these 19-inch rack-based computers like the PDP-11. In fact, that's where Unix got born, was on systems like that. Mm. And when people designed Unix for those systems, Nobody really thought much about, will these become multiprocessors someday? They felt so fortunate to have any kind of computer at all. Mm 
they thought about these single processors. And even back in the mainframe world, you tend to think about a job as running on a single processor. And so process was the abstraction of a processor. Then something happened. Time moved. By the time we got to the end of the 70s and in the 80s, multiprocessors became very common. And we got multiprocessors first because you had machines like the VAX and other machines that people put multiprocessors on them. And then you also got multiprocessors because of the microcomputers. And the physicists kind of pioneered some of this, but of course, now we're going there big scale. You don't buy PCs today that don't have at least two processors in most cases, right? Because the Core Duo is very successful, the XT totally. from AMD. And that's just going to continue going. So we now reach kind of a, a new point. But along the way, kind of around the time we got the VAX and started looking how to take microcomputers and use them as servers, call them microcomputer, but that's what powers many of the servers people use today is x86, very sophisticated chips with multiple cores on the sockets, multiple sockets on the motherboards, multiple boards, making up these huge systems, like you say, that schedule to hundreds of, of cores. And with multi-processors, you end up with multi-threading. Because within the same process, the same address space, now you're saying, I want to get more concurrency. I want to get my work done faster by taking advantage Absolutely. of these multiple CPUs. So we made a change where processor went to process now to where processor, or CPU, really maps to a threat. And that's the NT model. And it was based on recognizing how important multiprocessing was because the guys, Cutler and others, who worked on VAX machines, those were multiprocessor machines mm -hmm. at the point they worked on them. You know, they become multiprocessor before they came here. They knew this was the future. This is the future of server operating systems. So this is why our paradigm is different. Unix, because of when it was developed, the set of abstractions it uses make the process the unit of concurrency, and in NT, we use the threat. And so it's really more because of the historical factors and the types of things that people were thinking they would use the machines for that led to that. So this is abstraction, and this is really powerful. Unfortunately, this abstraction of processor to thread starts to break down. So if I'm writing an application like Concert, or I'm using Concert to write an application, I'm using a runtime like Concert, mm. I start caring about when things are happening relative to other things. And if I try and use the thread as a CPU, then the problem is I have that mapping as the kernel tries to map all those virtual processors, all those threads onto the physical processors, and they may not do it in a way that's particularly efficient. Mm. And so we'd rather have the user mode runtimes, by like concert, the concurrency runtime, we want them to do those fine-grained scheduling decisions. And the particular reason for it is they have much better information. Mm. They can take very specific information about the application, and they can use that information to make much better scheduling decisions. They also ship in tandem with compiler and tools environments, mm. which means that you can change those things together. You can say, let's put more information out from the compiler so that the runtime can make better decisions about how to schedule the work, whereas the operating system ships independently of the tools release. Absolutely. So this is a huge advantage, and this is why we think that moving that kind of decision-making down into the runtimes is going to be very important to be able to get a lot of concurrency exploiting all these cores that we're going to get. And so essentially the kernel's given up some of its abstraction, and now we're trying to make something that looks more like CPUs, and that's what we do with UMS. And the way we do it is to use the other thing that we love in particularly operating systems, maybe not in general programming. We love being lazy. Okay. Well, what does it mean to, to be lazy? Well, you can maybe think that I'm lazy because I figured out how to get the concert guys to take over scheduling. But honestly, we're still in the scheduling business because not everything runs in concert and there's a lot of system activity that takes place. But laziness is a, a general type of, uh, of technique where you say that you often try not to do things until you really need to do it. Yes. It's kind of like 
just-in-time activity. Procrastination. Procrastination, exactly. It's that kind of laziness. In fact, that's a better term. We've always called this kind of lazy evaluation, but I like procrastination <laughs> better because procrastination has a certain level of smugness and sure. stuff that laziness <laughs> just doesn't. Laziness well, is what your mother accused you of on Saturday afternoon. Totally. Procrastination. You'll it get it means, done, but not that's until right. you're ready, man. It just means Absolutely. you're a busy person. Oh, yeah. And that's really why you're doing it, because mm -hmm. you don't want to spend time up front doing something that you might never actually need yes. to do. Yes, like running a service that's not being used by anything. Yes. <laughs> so, back to UMS now. Yeah, that work Shatur did is really good in that account. This switching of the user threads without switching the kernel threads like we do now at the same time is just procrastinating. We lazily make the switch between the kernel threads because we may not have to. Mm. Because if I go from user thread 0 to 1 and enter the kernel, well, I have to make that switch then. But if I go from 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 2 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 2 to 1 to, oh, and now I go in the kernel, I only had to make one kernel switch despite having to make all those user switches as I was blocking. And in fact, that's one of the things you can now do with concurrency happening in user mode is something you can never do before. Not really. You never used to be able to block in just a UT. You always had to block in the kernel. You always had to make that transition and then you block in the kernel. You could wait in user mode and if you take uh, one of the main primitives we use for synchronization, uh, we now have reader writers, share locks and things, but we had um, critical sections. The critical section if it was on a multiprocessor, would actually try spinning a little bit to see if the lock hold time would come free quickly, because the overhead of going in and out of the kernel to block was fairly high. And so critical sections were actually very, very clever, interesting thing, which I won't talk about anymore today. But there's a lot of optimization that went in there, and a lot of it has to do with uh, procrastinating. Okay. So there's a lot of advantage when it comes to synchronization with procrastinating. So that's the main idea here, is that we're doing all these switches between different pieces of work, these guys can block because this guy says, go run somebody else now and let me run again when something interesting happens. He doesn't have to go in the kernel to do that. These other guys run. But eventually, one of these guys goes into the kernel and then we do the kernel switch. Okay. Okay, so we procrastinate on the kernel switch. Now, there's two other things that happens in UMS. And I hate to reduce this whole thing to something that sounds really, really simple. But conceptually, mm -hmm. it really is pretty simple. When I go in the kernel and I start running this thread, this might block. I might actually wait for I.O. to complete. Or I might explicitly wait for some lock to be released so I can acquire it. Well, when I had that, that happens, I need to return the CPU back to the user scheduler so he can find some other work to do. So that's the second thing. So the first time is, the first thing we do is procrastinate the UT, well, let me write that differently, we procrastinate the KT switch until it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And maybe in future releases we'll figure out how to make it even less necessary, but right now you enter kernel mode, and that includes page faults by the way, and we do the switch. Second thing is if KT blocks, it means it's waiting for something, it can't use the CPU anymore, return CPU to the user schedule. And the third thing we do, if you could kind of guess at this point, is when the KT operation, or the system call, or page fault, or whatever, finishes, notify the use get. So there's a, there's a queue. And this queue, we actually can link some of the data structures in user mode from the kernel that represent uh, a UT. And when the KT says, oh, I finished that work, but you gave away my CPU already, so I've been using kernel scheduling to complete my operation, we actually take that user thread and we just queue it on this queue. And I showed it being in kernel mode, but really the whole queue is in, is in user mode.
Now, the way that this USCED works mm -hmm. is a little bit different, and partly this is the nature of hardware, and this might change in the future. This is cooperative scheduling. This isn't preemptive scheduling. And the reason you end up without preemptive scheduling is preemption happens because you take an interrupt, the timer fires, something like that, and that interrupt, though, forces you into the kernel. So we're trying to not go into the kernel. We're trying to keep the scheduling down here. So it means this scheduling all ends up being cooperative. And maybe in the future we'll find ways of doing user mode preemption, but we're not doing that yet. But that means that scheduling decisions only get made at a couple times. They get made when a UT says, run somebody else. And it can do that because it's waiting to acquire a lock. And then the USCAD will choose to run a different thread. Mm -hmm. Or a scheduling decision gets made because a user thread actually goes, let's take this one, and goes into the kernel. Now, if we just run, we could maybe return. We do some optimizations like that. But once I've gone into the, the kernel, if I block and I give back the CPU, I have to make a scheduling decision. I say, oh, I have the CPU back. Now who do I run? Mm. And so at the two points that you make those scheduling decisions and you're in the use get, the use get simply can check the queue at that point and say, before I make my decision, let me see if any of the UTs that were waiting on synchronous system calls, if those system calls have completed, because then I can choose one of them to run, if that's the right thing for me to do. So these are really the three principles. These are the special characters, I think, in Perl. I kept forgetting what they were, so I wrote them on my board. <laughs> this is my office number here in building 26. I moved up to the third floor, nice. and unfortunately, I always forget what office I'm in. I've not been in that many offices at Microsoft, so right. ignore the stuff behind the curtain. Okay. These are really the three points about UMS. Excellent. So, you know, just sort of a net-net sort of testing my understanding. You're, what you're basically doing is you're abstracting away kernel locks Mm -hmm. uh, up into user mode into a sort of a to an isolated runtime that handles all of that sort of yes. the locking and thread stealing and all that stuff. Uh -huh. The application doesn't really know what's going on; doesn't need to. Right. But then again, because the kernel isn't, you know, the processor uh, a kernel mm -hmm. thread isn't locked, then other things in the operating system can happen. Yeah. So if you have a million cores, what I wanted to ask you was the following: though, let's talk mm -hmm. about a system that has, you know. 100 cores or 1,000 cores or someday a million cores and there's, okay. there's going to be heterogeneous cores. Yeah. Not all cores are going to do that, you know, some are going to be specialized for God knows what. Yeah. But my point is, how does this help solve that problem in terms okay. of making my application run faster? Okay. So I want to make, I want to make a couple points. One, just yeah. as a preface, just to be clear about something. Microsoft is not inventing user remote scheduling. <laughs> We're figuring out how to actually do user mode scheduling in a way that integrates well with NT so we get a high degree of compatibility. But it's also fundamentally changed how we start to think about the abstractions that we create. Mm -hmm. Because previously we created the thread abstraction and even though you went into kernel we did beneath the covers we did this kind of switch where you're now running the kernel stack and you didn't really care about that. You thought of it as a single thread when you were programming it. Yeah. But now we're realizing that we started to expose the nature of how the thread model works. And now we have all sorts of ideas that says, well, if we took this further mm -hmm. in Windows 8 and Windows 9, and so we're kicking around a lot of ideas today. Mm -hmm. The reason we're doing all this, though, is it's driven by a desire to improve performance. And where the performance comes from, like I said already, is moving decisions lower where they can be specialized. Mm -hmm. People try and do that sometimes with plugging different schedulers into the kernel and you just can't pass enough data into the kernel that it can really make good decisions. And a user mode scheduler, it has access to your entire address space. It doesn't have to verify that your variables are not corrupt when it accesses your address space mm -hmm. because if you have a bug in your program and the program falls over, you don't get the blue screen of death. Sure. Okay? Whereas the kernel has to be very careful. So the overhead of making decisions is lower, the knowledge can be far more specialized, the amount of information you can rely on to make decisions is much lower. So in answer to your question, this is a fundamental direction shift for us. By moving decisions about how resources are used 
lower where they're closer to the program, mm -hmm. where the responsibility for those decisions happens in code that has perhaps intimate knowledge Absolutely. about what the compiler did, about the metadata, about the data structures, where they can do experiments because they release in the same release as the compiler. So if you recompile with a new compiler, you get the new runtime. They can say, you know, we figured out a lot of interesting things to do. Maybe we figure out at some point how to optimize your use of caches. So if you have two different tasks and they don't both sit, fit in the same cache, let's not schedule them so they have to use the cache at the same time if you have CPUs that might be sharing caches in the future. There are so many changes coming as we figure out how to get to the world you describe. Mm -hmm. Today we expect to have memory coherency. That means that we have these cache sniffing buses in the hardware that say if you change state in a memory location, everybody else will be able to find out about it. You might lose coherency once you start getting into thousands or millions or maybe even just hundreds when we start to lose some of the coherency that we have. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, a step in an evolution which will affect the entire industry as we start to write software differently. But it really is a small step and we've tried to take this as a, as a very small step. Mm -hmm. the, um, in doing the architecture for this, one of the principles I used mm -hmm. was that I wanted to expose as few knobs as possible. That really we wanted to expose only what we thought concert would use. I want exp by expose, I mean publish in our uh, SDK. I wanted to only expose the stuff that concert would use. And uh, I'll tell you the SQL story in a bit if you act, remind me. If you remind me, I'll tell you about SQL. <laughs> um, because we think this will evolve. We think that by Windows 8 and Windows 9, we'll have gained a lot of knowledge and we'll have some ideas and we'll want to change things. And so we said, let's not invent a whole bunch of bells and whistles and expose them all, mm -hmm. although we have things we think we could do that are interesting. Let's actually get some data. Let's actually see these parallel applications. Mm -hmm. One of the, the jokes that everybody tends to make about the new brave world is Field of Dreams, if you remember the movie. I do remember it. If you build it, they will come. Yes. Yeah. Because often in our industry, we build hardware that was driven by data based on applications that existed and things that people wanted to do. Yes. Now the hardware is going to come first. We're going to mow the cornfield down, so to speak. No more faster clock rates. But we're going to end up with this baseball diamond. Will we find the applications that will come to play? So this means we're being cautious about how we're moving forward because we don't want to acquire so much legacy mm -hmm. immediately that it reduces our, our flexibility. Sure. So people are welcome to go take the APIs, it's in the SDK, play with UMS, but really the interesting way to use UMS is to use concert because concert will continue to evolve and make changes and the operating system will make changes and um, if you go natively on UMS at this point, you just risk that the next release or two may be very rough for you because you may find your code no longer works. It's just that, that risk to you. Sure. So we're encouraging people to try and use it for concert, but if they really have a reason and they can take the risk of things changing out from under them, mm -hmm. they're welcome to go and play with it and do experiments. And so now before we get to SQL, uh, just briefly what they've done, because I, I, I did, Mark mentioned they did some interesting work um, with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, for developers who write kernel mode applications that yeah. also have to scale to the future, mm -hmm. um, have you done any work in the kernel mode scheduler? We've done a lot of interesting work in the kernel mode scheduler. <laughs> but, but we don't have to go not, into that today. Not, not with UMS. Sure, certainly, understood. Okay, well, actually, when we get to SQL, we'll actually talk a little bit about that. Well, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's talk about the SQL story. So when we started looking for customers to do this, by customers we mean people who are writing code that will take advantage of this so we can get more ideas, we can hear their ideas, and we can build something that's going to be far more germane to the problems they have. Mm -hmm. So we always try and do that at Microsoft. We really try and be very mindful of how people will use what we produce. And as people who follow Microsoft and use our software for a long time, we don't always succeed at that, but it's really a high value anyway. We always want to try and understand how people use our products so we can build them to be used rather than just to look pretty, if, sure. you, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. So we were looking for customers to do this. We knew the concert was really important to the story because of all the things we talked about about Minicore. But we looked in the server world and we said, SQL has its own operating system called SQL OS, its own operating system down at the bottom, because it manages synchronization, it uses spin locks, it manages how it allocates threads, it makes a whole lot of decisions, and it uses fibers or threads and switches work tasks between those actual threads. 
it uses the threads to represent CPUs because it uses affinities to bind threads to CPUs. And they don't like it when we block in the kernel and don't give them back the CPU, for example. <laughs> so we worked with them in terms of UMS. And they got some pretty good performance improvements um, approaching what they got with fibers. But unlike fibers, we have far better fidelity to Win32. Mm. And so the likelihood that you will use UMS in SQL and then find out that you're not compatible because, like with fibers, the tab didn't get switched when you did the user switch. Well, because we switched the tab mm. with UMS, you don't have that problem you have with fibers. So that was all, all great. And at the present time, even though I think the code is still in the SQL tree, we're not sure that we'll actually turn it on for the next release of, of SQL. Mm -hmm. and for the I, exact reason you've already mentioned, because it could be that UMS as it exists in Windows 7 may not be like that in 8 or 9. No. You know, it might, could evolve. <laughs> well, that's, but this that's, is, not, that's not why. That's not why. That's not why. Oh, okay. Because we could have done that fine, because mm -hmm. SQL was able to work closely with us. It was uh, you know just having a few people at concert in SQL. Uh, we could evolve, and they could evolve with us, and they knew if they used it, they'd have to commit that if we made changes they would adopt yeah. and it made sense to them because they figured some of those changes we might make would be ones they wanted us to make as they mm. learn more. Now the problem is what I call an embarrassment of riches. Hmm. You mentioned Arun's work on the dispatcher lock. Yeah. The dispatcher lock so improved the scalability of the kernel for threading that the difference between the threads, SQL using threads, mm. and SQL using fibers shrunk dramatically. <laughs> which is what increased the scalability onto many more processors on servers. Excellent. And so it was excellent. It's an embarrassment of riches because then the point was, well, do we really want to turn UMS on in the next release of SQL because this other thing that came from the kernel team has gotten such an improvement. For their specific subset For their problems. specific subset problems. Yeah. And so we did great work with the SQL guys. They helped awesome. us understand a lot of things. But in the end, I'm not sure that they'll end up turning it on in the next release, but I think the release after with some of the other things that we will do and some of the other improvements, it's likely that they will turn it on. That would be my expectation. Excellent. But this dispatcher lock work, which you know, Mark has already talked about that Arun did, mm -hmm. uh, turned out to be uh, so important to the scalability of the mm -hmm. system for server applications, it kind of reshuffled the deck when we were in the middle of doing this. And so as Windows 7 goes out, we're looking for the primary customer in terms of how our, our end users will see this and the developer community will see this as being through concert. Excellent. So I think uh, you know we've had a few pieces on concert already on Channel 9. Thank you for your time. Great to have you on Channel 9 again. Well thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for